Let's get right to it. Why don't you turn with me to Revelation chapter 1. Racing through Revelation. That's what I'm going to title this study. When he was three years old, his father was murdered. His mother remarried, but did not like the child, so she poisoned him with mushrooms at the dinner table. Uh, He became violent at 12. One of his friends crossed him to be stabbed in the back. Uh, At 15, he was married, but could not stand his wife, so he strangled her. He married a second wife, liked her no better, so he had her murdered. His third wife, before they were married, he found out that she was already married. So he killed her husband, married her, and finally ended up killing her as well. His mother was getting uptight about all this violence she was seeing in her son, but she did not like her, he did not like her intrusion into his personal life, so he drowned her in her bathtub. He was a short man with a pop belly, bad skin complexion, and history tells us there was a horrible stench about him. At the age of 31, he was sentenced to death by flagging, so he ran down the stairs into one of his servants' quarters, grabbed a knife, and slit his own throat. His name, Caesar Nero. Horrible, horrible character in history was Caesar Nero. But more than just killing off his wives and mother and family members, he was perhaps most notorious for murdering Uh, millions, maybe millions for sure, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Christians uh, around his time and uh, was one who killed people all the time. That was part of his deal. Uh, Maybe in history, you heard about how he fiddled when Rome burned. We're not even sure that's true historically. Uh, It might be, but what is in fact true is he was one who persecuted the church uh, horribly So that when he finally kicked the bucket, uh, slicing his own throat, the church breathed a sigh of relief because they knew that uh, the one who was persecuting the church, uh, that very early church, uh, would be be done with. But the problem was, uh, Caesar Nero, well, he looked like Mr. Rogers compared to the next guy who came in line, a guy by the name of Domitian, Flavius Domitian, uh, the next uh, Caesar, if you would, of, of Rome. And uh, Domitian's uh, persecution, some people say uh, as many as six million uh, people were killed under his horrible reign. It was Domitian who would try to boil John the Apostle and uh, would ultimately exile him to the island of Patmos. If you remember that as they tried to boil uh, John, and by the way, that's not in the Bible. That's that's the you read that in uh, early, very early church history. Eusebius writes of John uh, being boiled, but he didn't die. Some say he was close to a hundred years old when they tried to boil him, uh, but he didn't die. Somehow, miraculously protected. So uh, uh, this guy uh, Domitian said, "Listen, uh, if we can't kill him there, let's exile him to Patmos." Now Patmos was uh, an island that was about 50 miles off the shore from where John was at that time, uh, probably near Ephesus. And so they took him to that rocky island and dumped him off there. It was a barren exile for him to be at a place where there wasn't much to do or see, maybe not even a tree to be found for shade. It was a very barren place, more perhaps than even it is today. But it would be there at that place, John, under great persecution and tribulation, if you would, uh, he had to uh, just be there for several years. But it would be at that place that John the Apostle uh, would write this book. And I believe this book, or the vision of Jesus Christ given to John the Apostle, uh, would be also meant to encourage the persecuted church. And, uh, you know, it really does do that. Some people say, Revelation's no fun at all, man. It's doom and gloom. But they miss the whole point. It's a vision of Jesus Christ, and it's a reminder that he's going to come, and he's going to rule and reign and make the wrongs right. I believe the church today uh, needs a bit of that reminder. As we're seeing so much in this, in this world that's so gloomy and so sad, and man, all you have to do is watch the news and see the horrible discussions and the horrible things that are being brought up and and you think, man, I find myself more and more uh, as I see what's going on around the world just saying, Lord, come quickly. 
Uh, now, some people criticize that and say, you shouldn't be wanting the Lord to come back so quickly. You should be wanting to make things right and engaging and bringing in the kingdom of the Lord. And, and uh, the problem with that is that's not what the early church Christians, they'd say, Lord, come quickly. It's almost like we've had it too plush, too cushy for so long that we just want to stay here. But I believe that one of the things we should not do is become so comfortable with living in this world that we don't long We have no desire for Christ's return. We should be looking, waiting, watching, ready, excited about, uh, reminding each other, even as the early church would remind each other, the Lord's coming quickly. They would say that. Uh, They would talk about it. Even in in sort of a way of greeting, they'd say Maranatha in in that sense of um, that the Lord is, is gonna return. And a lot of the church has lost that because some of the church believes, as we ended up last week there in verse uh, six, talking about dominion theology, where, uh, man, we got to bring in the kingdom of God and it's our doing. So we better get busy and elect Christian officials and get engaged and try to save the world. Oh, sure, we preach the gospel and share the love of Christ, but ultimately the answer is the return of Christ. Uh, And those who believe in the return of Christ Christ aren't lazy. They're not just sitting around saying, we're just going to wait and do nothing. But we are excited about, we're we're encouraged to know that Christ is going to come. People ask, well, if God is love, then why does he allow bad things to happen? Well, the thing is, if you read your Bible and read the book of Revelation, there's there's a time coming, which I believe is shortly, where the Lord is going to come and do just that. He's going to intervene. And he's going to make the wrongs right. Well, why does the Lord wait? Why doesn't he do it right now? Well, do you understand what that means? Uh, That means that those who've rejected Christ, when Christ returns, his second coming, when he returns, it's going to be a time where his wrath is poured upon a Christ-rejecting sinful world. So anybody who's rejected the the free gift of salvation through the cross of Christ, uh, that's going to be the end. I believe there's perhaps many in this room who would say, I'm so glad the Lord didn't come back, back like in 1982, his return. The rapture of the church didn't happen in 82. So the reason I say 82 is I remember that was one of those years where people were saying, this is the year where Christ is returning. Always a bad bad move naming the year or the day or the hour. I think that's a bad mistake Uh, because no man knows the day or the hour. Could be this year, could be next year, could be 100 years from now. I believe there's signs that point to the sooner return of Christ than the later. But at the same time, if the Lord came back in 82, many of you would not have been saved at that time and you would have gone through some real tribulation, literally, in your life. And and so for that to say, you know, the Lord is gracious and kind and long-suffering toward humanity, that's what Peter told us. uh, The Lord is not slack concerning his coming uh, or lazy is the idea, but he is patient, long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. That's why the Lord delays his coming seemingly, is because there's more work to be done, more people to be saved. So we're not gonna usher in the kingdom, however the Lord is waiting patiently for many to be saved. So uh, every time we see people saved on a Sunday morning, I get excited, maybe that's the last person on the list. Uh, You might wanna hang on to your hat. (laughs) Uh, That person says, I I confess Christ, (laughs) rapture the church, we're all out. That'd be great. Probably not likely here at Athey Creek because there's a lot of Christians around the world, but who knows, uh, something to think about. But all that to say, uh, we pick up here in uh, where we left off in Revelation chapter one, having uh, first seen the greeting uh, and the uh, introduction, if you would, in verses one through three. And then in verses four, five, and six, we saw that John is addressing the seven churches to Asia Minor. And he gives a introductory uh, explanation of Jesus Christ. And you saw in verse five and six that he's called faithful witness, first begotten of the dead, prince of the kings of the earth, which means he's next in line to rule and reign. Uh, loved, he loved us, uh, past tense, which is speaking of the cross. We looked at that. And he's washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God. Uh, And that's where we left off uh, at the big amen there at the end of verse six. Uh, So we begin in verse seven, where we're gonna see uh, uh, where John's gonna make a reference to the second coming of Christ. Now, let me just review, uh, because I believe there's a timeline of events that I see in the scriptures that might be helpful for you. People confuse the rapture of the church with the second coming of Christ. Um, I believe those are two separate events. 
Uh, what are the main difference, di- differences? Well, the rapture of the church, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, tells us how there's going to be a trumpet that will sound. Uh, the dead in Christ shall rise first, but we which are alive and remain, it says, shall be caught up. Now, those that are uh, uh, critical of the idea of the rapture biblically, they say the word rapture is not even in the Bible. Uh, correct. Uh, nor is the word Trinity, but I hope you believe in the Trinity. Uh, that is an essential doctrine of the Christian faith. Uh, the rapture is not, but it is funny. Those words, rapture and Trinity, are not in the scriptures. But it doesn't mean they're not true or described. The word there in the King James is, those which are alive and remain shall be caught up and meet him in the air. That's the rapture of the church, caught up. The Greek word there is harpazo. Uh, the Latin word is where we get our word rapture. So is the Latin uh, Vulgate uh, translation, if you would, of the New Testament, where the concept of the rapture uh, came from. So you can call it whatever you want. I don't care. You can call it being caught up or the rapture or harpazoed, if you want to be weird. Uh, You can call it whatever you want. But we will meet him in the air. Now, uh, as a premillennialist, one who believes that there's a literal millennial kingdom, the Bible says there's going to be a thousand year kingdom where Christ rules and reigns on this earth. I take that literally. The amillennialist says there's no millennial kingdom. Uh, the premillennialist, usually those are the, the people who believe that Christ is going to return in his second coming before the millennial kingdom kicks into gear, where Christ comes, rules, and reigns. That's the pre-trib, the post-trib, the mid-trib, the um, pre-wrath people. They are all premillennial. They believe that the Christ will return before that millennial kingdom uh, kicks into gear. It's the pre-trib rapture people who believe they, there's going to be a rapture, the rapture of the church, then there's a seven-year period of tribulation on earth. Uh, and um, what are we doing during that tribulation? I believe we'll be taken up to be with the Lord. And uh, it's going to be a, a great sort of marriage. Uh, the church is raptured. We're called the bride of Christ. There's going to be a seven-year uh, marriage uh, reception or, or uh, you know, celebration. As the Jews did in the, in the ancient times, they'd have the seven-day celebration for weddings. Uh, I, I like how that tradition would go. Uh, if you ever want to do an interesting study, maybe we'll do this as we get into the book of Revelation. The, the marriage of the Jewish uh, tradition uh, is very much linked to uh, the, the idea, the way it all comes down is the way Christ is going to come for his own bride. Uh, so we're going to be in heaven with the Lord, I believe, uh, raptured out before tribulation. And there's plenty of illustrations, examples of that. We'll get into it when I get into later about the pre-trib rapture and why I believe that. Uh, but there's good people who have different views on that <clears throat> and how the timing and how that's all going to come down. Uh, but all that to say, uh, the rapture of the church is where we meet him in the air. We're not, he's not going to set foot on the earth. The, the, the Bible doesn't put put that down at all with the rapture. So it's not really a coming. We have two comings of Christ. The first advent was when Christ came. The first coming was when he came in Bethlehem, born as a baby and lived among us. That was the first coming. His second coming is uh, that time where he put his foot down on the Mount of Olives. And the Bible explains how the Mount of Olives is going to split right in two when he puts his foot down there. What's interesting is when we go to Israel in November, I'm going to show you, we're going to stand right there and you'll notice that Jerusalem's built up everywhere. There's buildings all over the place, except for this one particular area of the Mount of Olives. And it's, it still continues to be unbuilt on. Uh, and the reason is because they found this massive fault line that goes right through the Mount of Olives, and it's huge. And they don't want to build on it. Building codes have not allowed them to build on it because of the fault line that's there. I find that interesting that that fault line goes right down through the Mount of Olives, right through where the Eastern Gate is uh, into Jerusalem. For you Bible prophecy buffs, that's an interesting tidbit of information about the way it's all gonna come down. Uh, there's even gonna be a river opened up, uh, but that, I'm getting ahead of myself. All that said, Christ is gonna put his foot down. He's gonna, his, his second coming, uh, there on the Mount of Olives, and that's where uh, he will subdue the nations of the earth and those that have gone against Israel. And uh, it's going to be radical. That's going to be the second coming of Christ. That, that's where things kick into gear, where Christ begins to rule and reign. And I believe he will rule and reign from Jerusalem. 
So all this television uh, news stuff that you're seeing about the Arab-Israeli conflict and how they want to divide Jerusalem and whose is it? Uh, the end of that qu question, we know. We know who's Jerusalem, really, who owns Jerusalem? Jesus. Uh, he owns Jerusalem. And uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the only city that God claims to be his in the whole Bible is Jerusalem. Isn't it an interesting thing that the world argues over who's, who gets Jerusalem? Um, in our current administration's map of the uh, Israeli issue, they just uh, showed this one uh, map and Jerusalem wasn't even on the map. Uh, even though the Jews say that it's their capital, the United States has yet to fully recognize Jerusalem as the capital of the Jewish people, even though they say it's their capital. Uh, America say, no, nah, it's technically Tel Aviv, but the Jews are saying, Tel Aviv's not our capital. Jerusalem is, and we're like, no, it's not. Uh, because, because there's tension, uh, the Palestinians claim Jerusalem. And so it's this huge problem that the Bible says God's gonna settle that discussion when Christ comes and rules and reigns from Jerusalem. So that second coming, that's when Christ comes, he'll rule and reign, and uh, for a thousand years, there's gonna be a reign here on earth. And, and then uh, we'll see how that all comes down, uh, even as we get in later into this chapter. But all that to say, uh, that's really where verse seven, he's gonna point us to is not the rapture of the church, but he's gonna make reference here to the second coming when Christ comes to rule and reign. Let's take a look, verse seven. It says there, behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. Again, the word amen means so be it. That's all it means, let it be so. In other words, this is all coming down and, and, and John puts in here, that's gonna happen, let it happen the way God wants it to happen. So uh, notice what it says, he's gonna come with clouds. That's kind of interesting for uh, even in the book of Acts, uh, let me read to you the book of Acts uh, chapter one. There's an interesting reference there. Uh, it says there, um, it says in chapter one of the book of Acts verse two, until the day which Jesus was taken up after through the Holy Ghost had given commandments to the apostles that he had chosen, uh, to him also he showed himself after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise uh, of the father, which saith he, you have heard of me for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days thence, hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? Uh, what's he talking? They, they're asking him, when are you coming again to restore the kingdom? And he said to him, it is not for you to know the time or the seasons which the father hath given, uh, put in his own power, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Interesting, when it comes to their question, when are you gonna come and take the kingdom? He says, it's not for you to know, but, but go out into all the world and preach the gospel to where it spreads even to the ends of the earth. I love that because you know, we have really seen that happen. First Jerusalem, then all of Samaria, Jesus said, and then even to the ends of the earth. Uh, you know, Athey Creek, in our small little way, we've, we've been able to do that. One of my favorite letters I got was from a gal who I never really knew very well here at Athey Creek, but she, uh, several years ago, was attending here, and, and uh, she was apparently some kind of a, a scientist, and uh, she and a group of 30 other scientists were shipped down to the South Pole, where they were living in one of those dome things, you know, or one of those scientific research stations. And she said that she was the only Christian. She wrote this letter saying, I'm the only Christian down here. And she says the satellite goes over the end of the earth there. Uh, so they can get, as the satellite comes over, they can download stuff and, you know, and send email and stuff like that from, from the ends of the earth. 
But she said, she wrote me the letter just to say, it's so great because uh, every time it comes over, I download a few more Bible teachings at Athey Creek and I can study the world uh, at the end of the world, you know, uh, the, the scriptures. And I thought, wow. Even the ends of the earth, uh, getting the gospel quite literally uh, with this gal down there. And uh, what a cool thing that Eighth Great got to be a part of what Jesus said would happen, even to the uttermost parts of the earth. Uh, that's, that's happened. And as I've traveled around the world, I've been able to travel to some pretty remote spots. Uh, I've been to places where I was the first white man that people had ever seen. Uh, and they thought, are all white men this ugly? Uh, no, uh, so there's a lot much nicer looking ones. But, uh, but the funny thing is, I remember talking to a guy and he said, where are you from? In his language. And I said, uh, the United States of America. And he said, what's that? Uh, like, uh, but what's amazing is this man was a Christian. Uh, he was out in the middle of the bush, uh, not far from the Sahara Desert. Uh, and just, he just heard, had heard the gospel message, but he didn't even know what America was. I thought that's really cool that even to the uttermost parts of the, of the earth, um, that has come to pass. But what's great about this scripture in Acts chapter one is the way, the, the context was his setting up his kingdom. Before that could happen, the gospel had to cover the globe. But then Jesus ascends into heaven and it says, and a, and a cloud received him up out of their sight. See, the way that he ascended is the way he's gonna descend when he comes his second coming. He's going to descend in a cloud. Now, what's interesting is that could be a literal cloud. The second coming of Christ, uh, maybe that's going to be Portland. That's a lot of clouds here. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but what's interesting about it is it says here in our text of the book of Revelation, he's going to come in a cloud or with clouds. But could it be that those clouds are the cloud of witnesses that will be with them? When we see the description of Jesus' coming, the second coming of Christ, when we get to the end of the book of Revelation, we're gonna see him come with 10,000s of his saints. Could that be the cloud of people? Uh, and we're gonna see that they're, the, the saints are, are arrayed in fine white linen. What does linen speak of? White linen in the Bible speak of? Purity, righteousness. We are robed in his righteousness. We're wearing white, clean linen because we've been forgiven washed in the blood of the lamb. And we're gonna come as a cloud of witnesses with Christ. 10,000s of his saints are gonna come with him. So maybe that's the cloud, um, could be. But we do know that's the way he ascended into a literal cloud that took him up. So interesting stuff, just as far as imagery goes, John's telling us that he's gonna come with a cloud, but the idea of where he's gonna come, we know it's not Portland. Uh, he's gonna come and set foot uh, in Jerusalem, but here's the deal. Every eye is gonna see it. That's interesting. Now you say, oh, that must be uh, Fox News, right, Brett? They're gonna see it on the TV uh, and they're gonna be able to watch it. Well, that could be, but what's interesting is it's much larger in scope than just people watching their television set. In fact, it says all kindreds of the earth are gonna see it and they're gonna wail because of him. Every eye shall see. And they also, it says in verse seven, those which pierced him. So what we have to understand is this is everybody. Even the people who have died in the past in history, they're all gonna see Jesus in his second coming. Even those who pierced him. I believe that's literally those who pierced him, the Roman soldiers that were there on the hill of the skull, uh, Mount Calvary, those very men that speared him, that nailed the nails. I think they're gonna see it. The Jews that were the ones who were condemning him and convicted him to death, they're gonna see it. And all of us who really are a part of Christ dying on the, on the cross. See, you don't blame the Romans, nor do you blame the Jews. You blame yourself because we're all sinners. Christ died for the ungodly, he died for us. Uh, that's something you gotta be careful of when you watch the Jesus movies. Man, I can't believe those horrible Jews killed Jesus. Uh, no, you are the horrible person and so am I that put Jesus Christ on the cross. We need to accept that my sin, your sin, is that which nailed Christ to the cross uh, and uh, we are as guilty as anybody. So everybody's gonna see when Christ comes. Uh, how he does that, don't know. Uh, but I believe that's just what John's telling us here. So it's gonna be interesting. Now, by the way, on this, uh, what's, what they're gonna do, they, will, they, they which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Why will, there, why will there be wailing? 
there, we don't know for certain why everybody's going to wail, uh, but there's going to be some serious wailing, uh, especially those, it seems, that were uh, the ones who perhaps were not repentant. See, we're going to be coming with Christ. I believe that's a different group. Those that are coming with Christ uh, to rule and reign with him uh, versus these who are going to see him, the kindreds of the earth. By this time, because of the rapture of the church, those of us that are pre-tribbers, we're not necessarily part of this group that's going to see him come and wail because of him. Uh, something for you to think about. Why? Because we're going to already have been sort of married, if you would. We'll, we'll come back. This is after our honeymoon for seven years with the Lord in heaven, the marriage feast of the Lamb, if you would. Um, seven years. So the coming of Christ is going to cause people to, well, listen to, to this. I'm going to read you from Zechariah. He, he gives a prophecy about the second coming of Christ. Listen, and this is Zechariah 12, verse 9. It shall come to pass that in that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. By the way, just freebie for you. Should the United States support Jerusalem? Should we support Israel? You know, it's amazing how many churches, uh, uh, even de whole denominations have started saying, uh, you know, the Palestinian statehood, let's divide Jerusalem in half. Even though Zachariah says, don't do it. Uh, in the last days, don't try to split Jerusalem in half and the nations that do it will be handling a cup of trembling. And right here it says the Lord will return and seek to destroy the nations that came against Jerusalem. That's why I pray we continue to support Israel. Uh, and that's something, or I, sh I say continue. Uh, currently, we have not really supported Israel. We are pretty much holding back Israel, frankly, uh, with our current position. But all that to say, this is what the Lord's going to do. He's going to come and destroy the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the spirit of grace and supplications. They shall look upon me uh, whom they have pierced and they shall mourn as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall there be great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadad Rimmon in the valley of Megiddo, uh, And the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart and their wives, the family of the house of Nathan apart and their wives, the family of the house of Levi and all the parts of, of Israel. What's it saying? When Christ returns, he's gonna come back to Jerusalem and it says they're all gonna wail and mourn. Now, later on in chapter 13 of Zechariah, uh, when things sort of calm down, they're going to say in Zechariah 13, 6, and one shall say to him, what are these wounds in thy hands? And he shall answer those which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Uh, you see, the Jews to this day don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. Many Jews, if you go to Jerusalem today and you talk to them, they don't really care about Jesus. They don't think about Jesus. If anything, they try to downplay the whole Jesus thing because he wasn't their Messiah in their mind. When Christ comes, they're gonna see the Messiah come in his glory, his second coming, putting his foot in Jerusalem. And when things finally calm down, they'll say, where did you get those wounds? Oh, <laughs> yeah, that, the cross where they pierced him. And that's where they're going to mourn. See, I believe that John is describing for us in the single verse what Zechariah is referring to, that they will weep and mourn over all the earth when they see him. Uh, what an interesting thing. What is Jesus going to look like um, when he comes in glory? Uh, if you were with us on Sunday, you saw maybe a little bit of the glorified Christ, but it's only a snapshot. Uh, but be that as it may, this verse seven is speaking of the second coming of Christ. Don't confuse that with the rapture of the church. Well, verse eight, it says there, I am alpha and omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the almighty which is, which was, which is to come. Ecclesiastes uh, 3, it says there in verse, uh, verse 15, it says, that which has been is now. 
and that which is to be hath already been. And God requireth that which is past. Huh? You're saying, what? Again, listen to this. This is, the, this is the Lord speaking. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is now, or that which is present. Uh, what's, what's the Lord saying? That which, that which uh, hath been is now, past is now, and the future has already happened. What? The point is, I believe God exists outside of time. Uh, some theologians call it the eternal now. Uh, that God is living in an existence that doesn't have linear time as we know it. Um, time is an interesting study. Uh, time and space and the, the various, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, scientists have talked about, even, you know, uh, Albert Einstein talked about these different levels of existence and all this stuff. And we only just have a tiny bit of knowledge about really what that means. But, but God seems to indicate that we really don't have a clue. But the Lord knows the beginning from the end. Why? Because that which has been is now. And that which has not yet happened has already been. God exists outside of time. And that's why a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years with the Lord is as, as, as a day. Uh, time is a different thing to God, if you would. So when we die and go to heaven, or if we're raptured and go to heaven, I believe we will be with the Lord and we will sort of step into his, what we would call clumsily time, or lack thereof, lack of time, the, more of that eternal now existence. The implications of that, if you think about it, starts to sort, short circuit your brain. If you really think about it, you know, think of that loved one who went to heaven years ago and you, you think, man, I've got an investment in heaven and I can't wait to see my loved ones in heaven. I really do look forward to seeing those who I've known, friends of mine who've gone on to be with the Lord. I look so forward to seeing them, but could it be, just something to think about, when you die and go to heaven, or the rapture of the church happens, and bam, you're there. Will it be like your friend will go, hey, welcome to heaven, man, I've been here for years, let me show you around. Or will it be this existence that you've already been there? And so have they, and you've been there for what we would think of maybe as eternity, uh, an existence that's outside of time. It's so hard for our brains to, to leave linear time and think about what an existence might be like. But, um, you know, some people think, oh, it's going to be so sad. They're up there in heaven alone. But I don't believe so. Uh, it's possible if, 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 if we can really think outside of the box that we are going to be with them. Jesus talked about how the kingdom of God is among you. Uh, what does that all mean? There's some interesting things when you start thinking of those implications. But the point is, uh, God exists outside of that. Now, with all that said, I am the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the ending, uh, which is, which was, which is to come. That is speaking of the eternal quality of God. Now, not only that is it speaking of the eternal quality, it's also speaking of the exclusivity of God. When you say something, if you were talking of the Greek letter, alpha, the omega, you're thinking the beginning, the end, the first and the last, the A through the Z, if you would. It's like when Moses was standing at the burning bush. Who, who do I tell him is sending me? And there, I am that I am. Right? That's uh, Cecil B. DeMille, Charlton Heston. Uh, God sounds like that. <laughs> I don't think that's how God sounds, but that's the way it was with him. The, the point is, I am that I am. You are what? Uh, you know, Moses is like thinking, man, what am I going to tell him? I am sent me. You are what? Now, what's great about this is when you think about it, God's name, Jehovah, which is the great I am, uh, it's that ego e me statement. It means I am, and you can fill in the blank. I am all. Everything. I am everything that you need. I am all that needs to ever be in existence. I am fill in the blank. Jesus helped us out a lot. When Jesus came and said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then he started telling us about who the I am really is. He would start saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He'd say, I am the good shepherd. I am the door of the sheepfold. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. 
you know, and on and on it goes. Jesus starts filling in that blank of saying the I am is everything you need. He's the A through Z, the beginning and the ending. The point is exclusivity. There's nobody like the great I am. There's no other alpha and omega beginning and ending. It's the Lord alone. Uh, that's the idea. So when you think of the alpha and the omega, you have to think of its exclusivity, that it's God alone. Only God can be the alpha and the omega. There is no other. There's no beginning, ending other than God. God is it. Uh, that's important, the exclusivity, but also uh, it speaks of his uh, all fulfilling everything that you would ever need. He's your all in all, if you would. He's the A through the Z of everything you need. He was and is and is to come. The Almighty. Uh, it's one of God's titles. Almighty God. There is no one other like he, him, the, the great I am. Now, this is an interesting description of who God is. God alone can lay hold of that title, the Alpha and the Omega. Now, just for you Bible students, something to think about, and I don't know the answer to this, but in the oldest of manuscripts and really the manuscripts of the New Testament that we have, which are plenty in number, uh, they would write the word Alpha phonetically out, but when they came to the, the Omega, they would just write the letter for the, the last letter of the Greek alphabet, the Omega, just the letter. They wouldn't write the word out. Why did they, did John just get tired and say, okay, I'm not gonna write that word out. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. Or was there some kind of meaning there? That, that's an interesting thing to think about. The alpha was written out, but the omega was just the letter. And some argue uh, that there was reason for that. Maybe because God uh, is the open-ended alpha and omega. There's still more than we even can, the A through the Z can't even contain all that is God. Uh, there's some interesting implications of that. But this idea of the Alpha and the Omega should not be new to the Bible student. This is a, a phrase that God uh, often would employ for himself, the beginning and the end, the A through the Z. Keep your finger here and turn with me to the book of Isaiah. Because I, I want to show you something that is important. I, I like to uh, take my Jehovah's Witness friend and my Mormon friends uh, to this discussion of who is the Alpha and the Omega, the one who was and is and is to come, the Almighty. Uh, take them there to Revelation 1, 8, and say, hey, who, who is this that's being talked about? And they will say, the Jehovah's Witness, well, that's Jehovah. And you can say, right. And ask the Mormon, they'll say, that's God. Right, good. And then take them to Isaiah chapter 41. Because this is an important title, uh, a, de a delineation that God uh, gives us of himself. In Isaiah 41, verse 4. It says in Isaiah 41, 4, who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. Uh, very, very um, important. Now, by the way, look at verse 25 of that same chapter. To whom then will ye liken me? Or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Um, uh, you know, there's no one equal to God. Uh, that's very important to know that. Well, flip over now, just turn the page to Isaiah 44. So we see God saying, I am the first and the last. Ask them, who, who is that speaking? The one who's calling himself the first, they'll say, oh, it's the Lord, it's Jehovah. Right. And then go to chapter 44 of Isaiah and go to verse 6. Isaiah 44, 6 says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. Man, that's pretty, that's pretty clear, wouldn't you say? Who's the first and the last? It's the Lord. There is no one else. There is no other God beside the Lord. Very, very important. Uh, now turn the page to uh, Isaiah 48. Just kind of... Hopping through Isaiah, you ask them, okay, who was that in Isaiah 44, 6? They'll say it was Jehovah, right? And then you go to Isaiah 48. And there we read in verse 12. Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he, I am 
the first. I also am the last. <laughs> Who's that? Anybody want to take a guess? God, right. It's Jehovah. And see, right now they're all totally agreement. Okay, good, good. Now, <clears throat> now here's where the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. And <clears throat> you say, Brett, why are you bringing the Jehovah's Witness and the Mormons to this discussion of the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last? <clears throat> it's real simple. Because um, of those two specific groups, and there's others as well, uh, the Christian scientists and others who don't believe in the same Jesus as we believe. That's why uh, people say, what's the big deal? Come on, Mormons are nice people, but they believe in a very different Jesus. Uh, see, the Jesus that the church of Jesus Christ believes in, the true Christian faith, uh, this isn't just me talking, this is just all of true Christianity for centuries and millennia have said that Jesus is God. <clears throat> They're the same. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So they picked up the rocks and wanted to kill him because they said <clears throat> he makes himself equal with God. And so Jesus, that's what he was saying. The Bible teaches that Jesus is God in the flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. The Mormons say, no, that's not true. Jesus was not that. He's the brother of Satan. Or if you're the Jehovah's Witness, he's Michael the Archangel, just the New Testament version of that. Uh, that's not the same Jesus that I believe in. I don't believe Jesus is Michael the Archangel. He's not an angel. He's not a good prophet. He's God. Now, <clears throat> with that said, you, you got them here. They're, they're okay, I, I agree. This is God talking, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Okay, now, <clears throat> with Isaiah... You've got those three scriptures of the Old Testament. Now go back to the book of Revelation with me. We read in verse 8 of chapter 1, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. And you ask them who that is, and they'll say it's Jehovah. But here's where it gets interesting. Go with me to Revelation uh, chapter 21. You, you can jot some of these scriptures down maybe because this is a helpful discussion in trying to decide who is Jesus? Who do you say that Jesus is? Was he just a good prophet or does he claim to be God in the flesh? Because in Revelation 21, <clears throat> look at verse six. And he said unto me, it is done or it is finished. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And you ask the Mormon, Jehovah, who is this? And they start being a little nervous, but they say, that's Jehovah. Now, you could argue this point with them because you could say, well, you know, the point is really Jesus is the one who said, I will give unto him that is thirsty the fountain of water of life freely. Who said that? Jesus was always talking about the water of the fountain of life that would gush forth out of the belly, torrents of living water. It was Jesus who talked about that. And also, uh, um, uh, it, it, the one who inherits all things, and he says, I will be his God uh, so this is starting to look kind of like Jesus. But what if they say, Brett, we don't like that. We don't care. We still think that's God saying, I will give you whatever life. Okay, I'll give you that one then. Just turn the page now. Go to Revelation 22. But you got to admit, that's very Jesus-esque, chapter 21. But I'll give that to you if you want. Revelation 22, starting in verse 12. It says in Revelation 22, verse 12, and behold, I come quickly. Question, who is it that says I come quickly? Jesus, and he's the only one who says that in the Bible. Jesus, behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates in the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root of the offspring of David, the bright and morning star, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him who that is a thirst come. And whoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Who's talking there? 
It's very clear, isn't it? Uh, verse 16, I, Jesus. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, and what did he say of himself? I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. The reason I go through this is not just to try to, uh, you know, be goofy or whatever. This is really important that you understand the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. It's speaking of God. Yes, Jehovah, God the Father, but it's also speaking of God the Son. So you got a problem. There's either two alpha and omegas, two beginnings and endings, which the whole point of that is that there are none other, no other alpha and omega. There can't be. That's the point of that little uh, sort of idiom the alpha and the omega, you have to have two of those, which is kind of b beside the point, uh, or there's two in one. That is that Jesus is God. And I've not really heard a good answer uh, when you take them through these alpha and omegas, the beginnings and the endings, because the Bible is so clear. God makes the claim to be the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. Jesus makes the claim to be the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. But if they don't even like that one, if that's not good enough, let's go back to our text in Revelation chapter one, because that's gonna come up again. And I think it's also gonna be more clear that Jesus is God because he's called the Alpha and the Omega. We'll see as we continue. It says there uh, in verse eight, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. That's God. And then he says in verse nine, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. And in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island of, that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay, so tuck away the Alpha and the Omega thing just for a second. And he says, I'm your brother and companion in tribulation. You know, if there was any bigwig in the early church at this point, it's John. He's the only living apostle. He's the only guy that was the friend of Jesus that hung out. The early church is blowing up because it's huge. The persecution of the church only caused there to be multiplication. So tens of thousands of Christians are just spreading like wildfire all over Asia Minor and even into Rome and really to all the world. By the time John's an old man, there's, there's tons of Christians in that region of the world. So John, he's the only living dude now. I mean, he's, he's, he's kind of outlasted everybody. He's sort of the big, big wig. But notice they don't call him most holy reverend father. Nor do they call him right reverend such and such. He says, man, I, John, not, not even Pastor John, not even, you know, um, uh, you know, reverend. I always can tell when people don't know me or they've never been to our church. They say, hello, reverend. I'm like, where are you from, man? Uh, <laughs> You've never been here before, have you? Because uh, the word reverend, well, it's, it's, I don't get it. I really don't get. Uh, I understand that people were trying to be respectful toward men of the cloth. But I don't even want to be called a man of the cloth. Uh, what is that all about? That, I just don't get that stuff. That's just church history that I don't really embrace. Uh, I want to be like John and say, man, I'm just one of you guys. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. Um, there's, there's a weird thing how we tend to try to elevate certain people or men. Sure, the Lord has called certain people to be teachers and pastors and leaders for sure. But I think we have to be extremely careful when we start promoting those guys and thinking that they're this and that and the other thing. Um, always a big goof, man. Uh, Jesus is the one who gets all the uh, exaltation. Uh, man, John here calls himself the brother and companion uh, uh, and fellowship and suffering of tribulation. That's, that's how he wanted to be known, not the most holy, right, Reverend John. Uh, none of that stuff. Um, watch out for that. I think that's a, a goof that the church traditionally has done is started to esteem pastors with fancy titles. Um, but he says, man, I'm just one of you guys going through suffering on the island of Patmos. And <clears throat> notice it says, for the word of God, now, there's so many ways we can look at this, uh, literally for the word of God, because he was about to write down on paper the word of God in the book of Revelation on the island of Patmos. But I also wonder if John even knew he was about to write the Bible. He was told to write the vision, for sure, but, but he writes it down not really knowing, oh, this is going to be the back of the Bible, man, this is going to be the last book of the Bible. The thing that I'm, uh, I'm just personally learning from this is that, you know, I believe that the tribulation that you and I go through, the suffering and the trouble, 
it really can fit this as well in that sometimes you and I suffer for the word of God. What's that? That the word of God might be made manifest in your life. That is when people see you go through suffering, through tribulation, through trials, through troubles, you can be uh, in that place of opportunity as is John. He can either be pouting on Patmos or he can be in the spirit on the Lord's day receiving the word and letting the word flow through his life. You can be the same way. You can say, man, Lord, I, I, I know I'm going through trials and troubles, but maybe your word can be lived out <clears throat> in my life so that people can see this is what a Christian person believes and what they do when trial and trouble comes. I, I, I think it's wise, like Paul, when he says, man, I rejoice in tribulation because tribulation brings about patience and patience, hope and hope experience. Uh, and man, um, Jesus talks about that. Even the, uh, the, the persecution that the church would feel, but Paul would say we have fellowship and suffering with Christ. John just said, man, the suffering, it's so that the word of God can come out. I think that's true for us as well. Literally true for John as he would write the book of Revelation uh, and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. When do you see Jesus in people's lives? It's when they're going through fiery trials like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as they're thrown in the fiery furnace. When did they see Jesus? It was when they were in the, the furnace. Uh, when did John see the vision of Christ? It's when he's exiled after being boiled then exiled on Patmos. Uh, man, may that be true for the word of God and the testimony of Christ when you go through suffering. Well, it says in verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. In the spirit on the Lord's day. We talked a little bit about this last week, but man, the Lord's day was probably, in this case, Sunday. Now, some people say, no, it wasn't, it was Saturday. Others say, no, it's Friday night. Uh, people get all weird out about this topic. When's the Lord's day? Well, I'll tell you when the Lord's day really was. Uh, and it's funny because this gets to be a very contentious point. Uh, you Christians are meeting on Sunday. And so you are taking up paganism. As some of our Seventh-day Adventist friends say, they say we've taken up paganism by worshiping on Sunday because they worship the sun. And that's what you're doing. Well, yeah, but if you worship on Saturday, you're worshiping Saturnalia, Saturn. <laughs> so, so careful on the sun thing. And none of us are worshiping the sun. At least I hope not. If you're coming and worshiping the sun, S-U-N, uh, uh, Ra or whatever, don't do that. That's paganism. But we worship the sun, Jesus Christ. And why on the first day of the week? See, that's the funny thing. Sunday was the first day of the week. We, we say Monday is the first day of the week. But in those days, the first day of the week was Sunday and Saturday was the Lord's day to the Jewish people uh, and the Sabbath. It was the Sabbath or Friday night, you should say, as far as from sundown Friday night uh, until sundown the next day would be the Sabbath. Um, but all that to say, people get all weirded out about this. Um, the early church, why did they start, according to, again, Eusebius and others wrote about why the church started to meet on the first day of the week. And it's really, I believe, quite simple. It was because Jesus rose from the grave on the first day of the week. That was Sunday. And there's evidence that the church really adopted Sunday as their day, and there's evidence of that. I like uh, the book of Acts chapter 20, a uh, great little story there where it says um, that, you know, Jesus, or pardon me, that Paul called all the disciples uh, together and it says, let me just read to you, it says, um, verse seven, and upon the first day of the week, this is Acts 20, verse seven, the disciples came together to break bread, which is communion, and Paul preached to them, ready to depart on the morning, and continued his speech until midnight. And you think I go long. <laughs> Man, midnight. Uh, and there were, you know, the, uh, there were many candles going, it says, and there was a young man named Eutychus sitting in the window just trying to get some fresh air and listening to Paul wax on and on this lengthy sermon. And, um, and you know the story, uh, Eutychus started to doze off and started to lean back and fell out the window. Uh, let that be a warning to you. He fell two stories and died. So no dozing during church. Let that be a warning to all. No, I'm just kidding. The Eutychus, he, he falls out, dies, of course, uh, is raised back up from the dead. It's a great story. But the point is, 
that the church would meet, and you'll see evidence throughout the New Testament of meeting in the first day of the week. But here's the main thing. Uh, Colossians 2 tells us that we are to not judge anyone. Let no man judge you concerning the new moon, the feast, the festivals, the, the Sabbath days. Uh, it, it, these rules that people try to impose on others about the Sabbath or the keeping of festivals or feasts. Uh, don't let any man judge you concerning those things. Uh, make sure you don't make a big deal out of it. I do believe in taking a day, setting it aside for the Lord. And that's a blessed time. It's something that we're called to do. Uh, but for some people, that might be Friday or Thursday or Sunday or Saturday. But don't let any man judge you concerning that, Colossians 2 says. But John is in the spirit on the Lord's day. I like that. Uh, he, he, even though he's exiled to an island, he still is uh, in the spirit. Well, I pray that we would be in the spirit. Um, we, are to, we are called to worship in spirit and in truth. I worry that Athey Creek sometimes we're good at the truth part because, man, we love Bible study. And in some ways, I, I do worry that everybody gathers here on a Wednesday night or a, or a Sunday morning. And, and, and I know there's a lot of you that are worshipers in spirit and in truth, but I, especially on Sunday morning. I love leading worship on Wednesday night, and I'll tell you why. Because you guys tend to sing it out. In fact, this is the funnest time for me uh, to lead worship because you guys sing. And there's people who lift hands. You're not afraid to lift hands. This is just a little diff different group, this Wednesday night group. But on Sunday morning, man, it, it, sometimes if you ask the worship band, you'll, they'll, they'll, they'll back me on this one. Sometimes Saturday night and the two Sunday morning services, maybe it's because there's people coming and checking it out. Maybe there's people that aren't saved. Maybe there's people that just are a little more uh, opposed to the idea of lifting hands, singing out with voices, clapping hands. Uh, you might sense a little bit irritation for me sometimes. I try not to uh, let that show, but it does, because here's what happens. I'll, I'll say, hey, you guys, let's clap our hands. The Bible says, clap your hands, all you people, shout on the other voice. And I'll say that. I'll read the scripture. So we're going to clap our hands. And inevitably, there's an entire row of, of people, you know, 20-somethings or whatever, and they're just standing there like this. <laughs> and in my heart, I just go, man, what a bunch of nerds. I mean, <laughs> it's like, man, they just don't want to clap. Uh, what's, are they too cool, too cool to clap? Uh, you know, and, and I have to check my own attitude, uh, but... But I'm not really interested in having a chosen frozen church. I really am not. Uh, I think that we need to sing out with loud voices and clap our hands and be in the spirit. Um, we, we, we need to maybe check our own hearts on that because we can go to a U of O game and scream and paint our bellies yellow and green and ah, you know, be all crazy. Uh, but you come to church and man, it's like, yeah, we're worshiping God. So be really quiet. No, the Bible says, loud symbols, loud voices, uh, with a celebratory kind of attitude and heart. And man, the lifting of hands. Uh, I don't, I'm not interested in being good Baptists. I like Baptists in their theology, a lot of it. It's great stuff. But man, you, if you're not careful, you can become pretty chilly, pretty cool toward the things of God. Um, I'm counting on you Wednesday nighters to come Sunday morning and let's change the whole vibe. I really am. I'm, I'm serious about this, man. Uh, by the way, when, when we started Athey Creek uh, years and years ago, 17 years ago now, uh, I remember there was all these new people coming in. I remember this one Sunday, we had 20 people. I was like, wow, 20 people. But I was really struggling because at that particular time, um, there were very few of the 20 that would actually sing or lift hands or it was like uh, people, it was so new, a lot of people were just kind of looking around and um, kind of like, what do we do? I think Tracy was the only one there that kind of knew what to do. And my wife, Debbie, uh, they were there uh, and I could count on those two, but everybody else was kind of like, well, I'll never forget, one of my buddies from Southern Oregon came uh, this one Sunday and he sat right in the front chair, right in the front row, front chair. And I started singing worship, you know, and man, his hands went up and he was like swaying back and forth and doing the wave, you know, and the woo. And I was like, and all the 20 Athey Creekers were there going. But, but you gotta understand this guy, this friend of mine, he, he had just a real heart for Jesus. And I remember just thinking, Man, somebody really likes to just kind of express, you know, and I'm not the waver dude, you know, the guy that does all that stuff, but, but the fact that he was there and it was so contrary to what everybody was kind of used to, it, the Lord kind of did something that Sunday and there was a few people who were kind of like, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? It's like that little, you know, you're, you, those are the hard ones, you know, where they just barely lift their hands, you know, and, uh, 
people ask me, why do Ethan Greekers do the one-handed you know, thing? Uh, it's because we're carrying our Bibles in the other hand. <laughs> That's my excuse. But one thing to think about, not to be overly weird about the hand lifting thing, but it says lift up your hands. <laughs> it's okay to lift one hand. That's all right. You can do that. But, uh, but it is interesting that it says lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Kind of interesting. Just a freebie for you. But... <laughs> When that guy showed up that one Sunday and just worshiped God, told, and he didn't know he was the only guy really singing out, but it, it actually was a jump start, and, and it was kind of cool because that was sort of the beginning of some of the neat worship that started to come from this fellowship. Honestly, I, I remember that very Sunday where people were like, oh, you mean you can lift hands here? Uh, it was kind of cool. We need a little bit of a, a shot of adrenaline spiritually uh, in that, and, and I think that we can teach the, the rest of the congregation what it means to be uh, in the spirit on the Lord's day. Just something to think about. I need you guys to be fired up, prayed up, ready to come with a heart uh, to worship Christ with an attitude and a, and a countenance uh, that is really befitting to standing before the throne of God. Amen? Amen. 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 See, we're starting to be Pentecostal right now. <laughs> I gotta testify. And you're like, yeah, woo, woo. Okay. Oh, we need to hurry. <laughs> So he's in the spirit on the Lord's day. He hears the voice saying, I am Alpha, Omega, the first and the last. Um, uh, and uh, verse 11, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last. Does that ring a bell? Now, this is the voice that John heard saying, I am the Alpha, the Omega. So now we have to say, well, who is this? And the Mormon, the Jehovah's Witness, has to say, that's the, that's the Lord, Jehovah. Because he's saying he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the first and the, the last, right? But check it out. The, vo the voice says in verse 11, uh, it says, what thou seest write in a book and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned, I saw, now pause for a second. We know from Sunday, if you were with us on Sunday, we looked at this, this person, and we see that it's none other than Jesus Christ. So the voice that he hears is the, the a resounding voice of Jesus speaking to John. And we know this is the revelation of Jesus Christ given to John. And here's where the rubber meets the road. It's Jesus speaking to John who calls himself the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. You can't get around it here. So all you really need is Revelation chapter 1 to show that Jesus is God. Because we saw in verse 8, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, and then it saith, the Lord, that's Jehovah, which is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. No question, that's Jehovah, Father, God. But then you say, verse 11, the Alpha, the Omega, first and the last, that is none other than Jesus Christ. I believe it's as clear as a bell. Uh, you don't even have to try to work that out. It's just there. So the point is, Jesus is God. You say, bro, what's the big deal about that? Well, you got to understand, that's an essential doctrine of the Christian faith. If you deny that Jesus is God in the flesh, you do not know Jesus. Uh, and don't, don't be sucked into some of these cults that try to take away from what Christ claimed to be. John talked about that in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He called that the spirit of Antichrist, those that would try to take away from Jesus and not declare him to be God in the flesh. Very, very important part of Christianity. So we saw this on Sunday. Uh, what did he see? He saw seven golden candlesticks, end of verse 12. Uh, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one's, uh, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle, and his head with hairs which were white like wool, and white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, his feet like fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun that shines in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. <laughs> there it is again. Uh, this is Jesus. Now, we looked at this on Sunday. If you missed it, I'd really recommend that you uh, catch up with us on that one, because this is setting the tone, the pace, the whole thing for the book of Revelation. The, the, the vision of Jesus that he sees here, it's, it's huge, huge. 
Uh, in verse 18, he says, I am he that liveth and was dead. That's Jesus who resurrected. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Um, Jesus is the one who has the keys of hell and death. Some people say um, that's Peter at the golden gate there uh, in, uh, in heaven. You know, and you hear all these jokes about the pearly gates or the gate where Peter's sitting, uh, you know, f- uh, filtering people, whether they can come in or not. And those are all funny little jokes and everything. However, uh, Jesus is the one who holds the keys of death and hell. Uh, and it's only through Christ can you be saved. There's no other name under heaven by which men can be saved, and that is Jesus Christ. He's the one who holds those keys of death and hell. Um, um, uh, by the way, uh, I kind of wonder, you know, is this a lock um, uh, to let people out or let people in? Have you ever thought about that? See, uh, you know, it's, it's like uh, when it says, uh, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death. I believe we were all headed for death and destruction. And Christ has the key to let us out of the pickle that we were in. Um, You hear stories of the Titanic and how the people in the lower decks uh, were actually literally locked in uh, to those lower decks. And there were people that saw them there, but they were locked in so that they wouldn't cause trouble for the people that had made it. Um, If you would, that's us. We're the ones going down with the ship because of sin, man. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. There's no one righteous, but Christ has the keys. And he opens up that gate, if you would, or the, 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 um, f- to be let free, to be set free, uh, to be saved. Man, I'm so thankful for Christ because he'll open for anyone that's willing to follow him. Anyone who's willing to, to repent from their sins. Well, verse 19 In verse 20, uh, I'm going to save. I don't want to rush through uh, those two verses um, as they are key. Verse 19 is going to be a huge, huge key to understanding the book of Revelation. Um, When people say they don't understand the book of Revelation or they say it's too difficult to understand, um, we can say uh, that's incorrect. If you just follow what Revelation 19 is telling us, and, uh, and then also verse 20, great stuff that we'll cover perhaps next week. We're out of time tonight. So let's pray together. How thankful we are, Lord, that you are the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. That we have a savior who is not just a good man or a great teacher or a prophet, but Lord, we know that you Uh, lowered yourself and became humanity, made yourself of no reputation, took upon yourself the form of a servant, became in the likeness of man, even was uh, a servant, obedient even to the death of the cross, Philippians 2 tells us. What an amazing thing. It's hard for us to fathom a God who's outside of our time and space and our own existence would come into uh, our humanity. And really put yourself in that place where you died for the sins of the world. How thankful we are, Lord. I pray that this congregation would be a group of people that fully uh, are appreciative and thankful, so much so that we too would be in the spirit on the Lord's day, as was John, Lord. Those that would be worshiping in spirit and in truth, coming with an attitude to celebrate and to worship. Father, I pray that we'd be ready for that that time where we stand before the throne and worship you in your holiness, Lord, that we would be a a worshiping people even here now, not waiting for that time uh, when we all will stand in the sea of the nations before you, but until then, that we'd be right here in this little warehouse giving glory and letting your spirit just move freely in this congregation, that the manifestations of your spirit would be seen and that we wouldn't quench the spirit, but rather be open to and ready to move in the power of your spirit. Lord, I pray that you'd breathe life into this church, Lord, and that you do a great work that not only here in this room, but as we go out into all the world and preach the gospel, even to the uttermost, I pray that we'd be effective, that we'd have the message of Jesus on our tip of our tongues, Lord, and that we'd be able to give you all glory. 